Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Things We Know. I'm Lisa Callahan. And I'm Carrie Morin. And today we are back to talk again about hormones. <laughs> yeah, somehow this is starting to turn into that menopause pod that I didn't want. <laughs> <laughs> No, this is really interesting stuff. Um, we last week we did sort of part humor, part horror when we talked to my friend Amy Pickard again around um what she calls cougar puberty because hands down, she is the person that has had the most um symptoms and the most extreme symptoms. I have been with her while well, we saw her last week. She had a fan going on her, like I have been with her when she is just dripping and I'm like freezing. So I just, I've never seen anybody go through this. And so she did, she sort of highlighted some of the extreme menopause symptoms that happen when we reach a hormonal imbalance. So we wanted to bring our listeners and ourselves some more helpful info and maybe some light at the end of the tunnel with our guest hormone expert, Dr. Krista Anderson Ross. Welcome Krista. Thank you for having me. Yeah. We're so happy to have you. And since you're also here because, you know, Carrie, I'm going to let her do your uh, official introduction. Yay. <laughs> All right. I'm so thrilled to introduce you, Krista, because not only are you one of my dear mom friends, although you, we don't live close anymore, you're also a colleague that I have learned from and admired and even got lucky enough to collaborate with when we were doing hormone happy hours for moms <laughs> at kids' school. People would actually at an auction, sign up because Krista is that good. And they, they, people wanted to learn from her and I just kind of played, played along. Um, so I think like, I don't know, early on the way I felt like, I felt like you were passionate about helping women have a less bumpy ride into menopause. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to get into your official, we'll get into that in a second, but um, so take a sip if you have some, like, some water or some other drink, but um, cause you've got one impressive resume and I'm not likely to capture it all, but here are some highlights. So you graduated from naturopathic medical school 20 years ago. Um, that's when you were living in Portland, I believe. And you now have a practice in Bend, Oregon, in the beautiful central Oregon focused on supporting people through these times of hormonal shifts, like mostly perimenopause and menopausal women. So perfect. Um, you're passionate about optimizing the circadian rhythm for better sleep and optimal physiological functioning. So essential. And we'll hear more about that um, in today or next week's episode. And, uh, and you've been a staff physician for Doctors Data International, and which is cool because that's a company that does functional medicine lab testing, which I think people are more and more are learning about and interested in. You've been doing that for 10 um, and you're on the clinical support team there where you get to research, write articles, speak at conferences. That's the stuff I know that you love geeking out about. And I think it's gotten you all over the world, really, um, where you work with coaches, doctors, and oh, you coach doctors, I forgot, around incorporating functional medicine testing into their practices, which is so cool because it's specifically around cortisol, sex hormones, melatonin, and neurotransmitters. Very cool. Like you are exactly the person we need to hear from today. You also, interestingly, and we may need to have you back about this. You do a lot to support adolescents through hormone and neurotransmitter imbalance. So huge. Um, and you've been speaking on that and brain development and mental health since 2020, since right before COVID hit. I remember you were, you had all these things planned. Um, and you live here in central Oregon where I am right now, even though I, don't, I miss seeing you, I think you're in the best place for being such an outdoor buff. Um, and you are a mom to three amazing kids that I love and also miss. And you've been married to your husband for 29 years. I can't believe that. So welcome, Krista. Thank you. I'm so happy no, to be here. no offense to Will. It's not that I can, <laughs> I just can't believe any of us have been married that long. That's all I meant. <laughs> Well, that's what I said too, right? It's like, how can I be so old that I've been married to the same person for 29 years? You got wow. married at 12. Don't, that's just, yeah. stick with that story. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I, that's an amazing resume. I mean, you were really, it feels like to me on the forefront of functional medicine and naturopathy, like 20 years, that's a long time. That was not a known thing 20 years ago. Well, it's definitely been a journey. The last 20 years have been a very different journey than I thought I was going to have when I was in medical school. Let's just put it that way. So sure. my intention was to be a pediatrician naturopathic doctor. And that is what I did for my first 
mm, well, close to 10 years out of medical yeah. school. And I was, you know, in my thirties when I graduated and in my mind, hormones were just something natural that we produced. And one day they disappeared and your body knew what to do. And then you just moved on. And so as my kids in my practice got older and their moms were coming to me, like begging me to help them with their hormones. And I'll admit, I didn't really pay a lot of attention to that. When I was in naturopathic medical school, I found estrogen and progesterone and that whole system overwhelming and very confusing. I really mm. did. And so when I got to that point where I had these, these women begging me to help them with their hormones, I'm like, I better figure this stuff out. And <laughs> I kind of put it out to the universe and not kidding, like this sounds super woo woo, but this is true. And, and this might, you know, bleed into the crone part where I just said, I need to figure out hormones. And, you know, here I am 10 years into my practice all of my friends who might know a little bit more about this than me are really busy. Nobody really has time to take me under their wing. How am I going to figure this out? And then one day um, I signed up to attend a little conference that this little lab um, that was called Lab Bricks in Portland was doing. I went to the conference as I was leaving the woman who owned the lab grabbed me and said, hey, I want to grab a cup of coffee with you. And I was like, you do? Okay. And turns out she lived in my town. We grabbed a cup of coffee. She invited me to coffee. I said to my husband, I think she's going to offer me a job. I showed up. Sure enough, she offered me a job That's working awesome. for what was then Labrix and was now has now since been acquired by Dr. Shade International. So therein began my hormonal journey, which was not easy to understand yeah. and learn. It is not easy to understand what these two hormones, estrogen and progesterone, do to our bodies and what happens when they get out of balance. That that right there answers what I think is a ginormous question and really came out of Amy's um, as well, which is this idea of doctors don't know and it, uh, that much about it. And, and even women doctors, right? Like we're surprised that women are just like, doctors don't know. And that makes sense. If it feels really overwhelming in the grand scheme and in the moment when you're getting out of uh, medical school, you're just like, well, I don't even have to deal with that right now, especially if you're in pediatrics or whatever. So that makes total sense. Um, Carrie sort of said this a minute ago, there is so much to cover here that we've already decided that this is going to be a two-parter. So today we thought we'd start with um, just some of the things that were all, like you said, before we got on here, sort of universal. Um, and then th to bring awareness and some tips around it. Um, so yeah, let's start with the basics, Carrie. Yeah. I mean, the basics being what happens, this is, this is what I remember asking you. And this is what I hear people asking all the time. What happens with our hormones and how best to understand how to work with them? Um, I think you were the first person who, who helped me understand while I was learning and studying nutrition, how many hormones we have and how the big ones kind of affect all the other ones. And you, you use the word cascade, like there's a cascading effect, um, so, but like how to understand it. So we don't feel like victims and we don't feel like we have no control. Right. And, and then I think that that's, a, that's a juicy enough discussion to then save our, you know, next conversation for sex and sleep, which are the things that come up a lot, or maybe they're the things that I think about a lot with, um, how I'm hormone, like how I'm hormone deficient sometimes, or just feeling like they're out of control. Uh, does that feel doable? Yeah. cover all that. <laughs> yeah. So I love what you wrote when we were talking to you about this uh, conversation, because it's, it is uh, truly, again, we, we joke that this isn't a menopause podcast, but it is something that is so on the forefront for most of our listeners. And if, if not now, eventually will be. Um, so I want to quote you. It's, you said, women have so much healing and wisdom to offer the planet as we approach our crone years, how do we prepare our minds and our bodies to be up for the challenge? Mm -hmm. um, I love the idea of crone. Carrie already said it. I, I, I think of, I, we think of crone as this like little crumpled old lady, right? And no, we're like the smartest, the most wise. We have all this stuff to share. Um, and we're losing our damn minds because of our hormones. <laughs> so how do we prepare our minds and bodies for these crone years? Yeah, I, I, I love that question. And I think that it's really important. I love, you know, so 
your image of the, you know, hunched over, dried up crone. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's important to start there because in my journey, I came to a point where I realized, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, a woman's life expectancy was 47 years. Mm. At the turn of, of the 21st century, a woman's life expectancy was 84 years. Wow. Okay. So like that right there is a mind blower. So, mm -hmm. you know, of course, women's life expectancy was lower because so many women died, you know, in childbirth. And of course that's improved. Thank goodness. Having said that there weren't that many women that made it, you know, past menopause. Yeah. So that image of the crone, that older woman, there weren't many of them. And so the ones that were there were just hanging on by a thread. Okay. So the poor, the point being for me, when that hit me, when it's like, oh, it's not just all natural and it's not just, you know, oh, natural. And it's all going to just shake out the way it's supposed to, because in this modern world that we live in, we are encountering as many stressors in a day as a primitive person would have encountered in their entire lifetime. Wow. Okay. So wow. when you think about the impact that that has on our entire system, that needs to be played into what kind of support do we need so that we can withstand the modern world, which mm. we might, you know, at the outset might think, oh, it's so much cushier and easier because we have hospitals and we have medicine and we have cars and we have all these things that, you know, technology that make our life easier, but they also make our life harder because of the perpetual stressful inputs that we're receiving. So it's important to understand three things in, in order to get a picture of, of hormone, hormone balance. And I'm going to go and I'm going to start with younger women and I'm going to bring, you know, us up to the present, if you will. Um, but I want to say that it's important to understand how the three different axes impact each other. So one of the axes is the stress axis, right? So cortisol, right? And that's called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, HPA axis. There's also an HPO axis, hypothalamic pituitary ovarian. Mm -hmm. And then there is another axis, a third, hypothalamic pituitary thyroid, okay? So they make a triangle. And so when one of those is out of balance, somehow it's going to make the triangle into a weird shape and it's going to impact the other two HP axes, okay? Mm -hmm. Hypothalamic pituitary axes. And it's going to interfere with how the brain talks to the thyroid, the ovaries and the stress system. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when we're younger and we're cycling, we have the way that our cycle looks is the first half of the month is called the follicular half of the month. And that's ruled by estrogen. Okay. Estrogen makes us is, is a, the proliferative hormone. It makes our breasts tender. It makes them larger. It makes us bloat. It makes us irritable. It makes us cry. All the things when we think of hormones, it's really estrogen, yeah. right? All, all the things that we don't love, let's say, about hormones. It's also one of the things that we love about hormones. I mean, because it also makes our skin supple and it makes our vaginal tissues supple. And it does all kinds of really important things. It impacts our brain, our heart, our bones. We love estrogen, but we don't want estrogen to rule the day. So the first half of the month, then the second half of the month rolls in, and that is the luteal phase of the month, which is ruled by progesterone. So estrogen does a little dip and progesterone does a spike, okay? And that's the second half of the month. And progesterone comes in and kind of tamps down a lot of the things that estrogen got rolling, right? Mm -hmm. So it's gonna come in and it's going to um, counterbalance some of the effects of estrogen. And then when it gets at the bottom of its peak, that's when a woman has her menstrual, her menses. Okay. Okay, that's when she bleeds. So right around the age of 37, a woman's progesterone levels take a big dive, okay? A major nose dive. And it's kind of interesting when you think about that around, you know, the woman's previous life expectancy. So a lot of women will tell me when I'm working with them in my practice, they'll say, gosh, you know, suddenly I became hormonal and I mm -hmm. started to feel like what's bothering me is my hormones. And I can't put my finger on it, 
but I just feel like it's my hormones. And I'll ask them, what, when did that happen? And I can't tell you how many times women say, when I was 37. Wow. It's crazy how often I've heard that. And it makes sense to me because progesterone, so estrogen kind of maintains and progesterone just does this dive. And so, and that maintains, you know, for the rest of our life where progesterone is now lower from 37 on. So it doesn't have the same power to counterbalance those proliferative effects of estrogen. Wow. Okay. That makes total sense to me. I, okay. Honestly, you're describing it so well. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. And so, and then, then when we hit our forties, we're already a little lower in progesterone than we were. So that's a shift and it makes us feel differently. And then we get into our forties and some, and then some women experience what we call perimenopause, you know, where they might become less interested in stress, in sex. Um, they might, their sleep might start to be bothered. Um, they might start to experience some night sweats and maybe some, even some hot flashes, but they're like, I'm not going to go through menopause for 10 more years. What is going on? Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I tend to see that in, you know, what I would say younger women in their forties, because the average, you know, age of menopause is 52. So I would say that when I see that in younger women, that tells me that the HPA axis, the adrenal axis, the stress axis is off kilter. Mm. Okay. And we're going to look at thyroid hormones and we're going to look at their, we can um, run salivary testing where I can see what is happening with their stress hormone cortisol throughout the day. Cortisol has two functions. It has a preemptive function that, that sets our circadian rhythm. It's higher when we wake up in the morning and then it comes down, it kind of does this and it flattens out as the day progresses. And, um, okay, wait, I just lost my turn of thought for a second. All right, I was talking about um, adrenal hormones. Okay, so when a woman has been through a lot of stress in her life, which <laughs> we'll often see in women in their forties because they've been pretty busy raising children and having a career and doing all the things that women do. So the likelihood that their HP axis is going to be a little bit off is pretty high. Mm. And so we'll measure their hormone, their adrenal hormones. And unlike what most people think, they're not high. Cortisol levels are usually not elevated as people think they're going to be. They actually probably were elevated, but then at this point, they're actually lower. Mm -hmm. And so those lo lower adrenal levels and our circadian rhythm are going to impact everything about how we feel. And it's also a vitality thing as well. And so that will very often be the thing that precedes the, um, the, the loss of libido. And it will very often be the thing that precedes that, oh my gosh, I feel hormonal. Mm -hmm. Does every woman have perimenopause or no? Not necessarily. That's okay. a great question. Technically, if, if all is going well between those three axes that we talked about, one should be able to sail through menopause. <laughs> so what but I'm still hoping we, for. <laughs> right. Well, and, and so what, what I will do with those younger women is get their, I want to get their HPA axis balanced. Okay. So we're going to be looking at their cortisol levels. We're going to be looking at that whole system. We're going to look at their thyroid levels and we're going to get all that balanced so that when they do hit the point where their hormones just shut off, <laughs> which isn't, it's not a complete shut off, but it, there's, they become quite diminished when one goes to menopause, they Sad. have adrenal reserves. Okay. So fascinating. It's it's interesting because I was just thinking the first time I, and we were, we were quite young when fried green tomatoes, that movie came out, but do you remember when she's like, Oh honey, you need hormones. Cause she didn't know why she was crying all the time and why she, you know, didn't feel attractive to her husband and all that. And I, I remember that. Was it Jessica Tandy? Yeah, was that her? She Tandy. said, Oh honey, you need hormones. And I remember being like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, and it wasn't, it was probably not long after, you know, my mom had gone through menopause and I remember us being a little bit like, Ooh. you know, like, I mean, she'd explain that, but it, it, she definitely wasn't herself for a couple of years. She was, but then she'd have these moments where she was just extra stressed. And I think about like what you were saying about life expectancy, but also just the times we're in, 
So when you're talking about stress hormone and cortisol and all the extra stress that's been piled on in the past few years and, and the stress we have for the people we're raising. Um, and being a sandwich generation. Right. That's the other thing too. Yeah. You're also helping your parents. Right. So like when you think about all that piling on, I feel like your job helping with women with this is harder. Well, and I'm glad you brought up, you know, your mom using hormones and that comment in that movie, because the hormones that when we're using then, you know, versus the hormones that we have available to us now are like night and day. And, and I'm, I'm the other reason that I'm glad that you brought it up is because unfortunately hormones got a really bad rap because of a big, huge um, study that they did on women called the women's health initiative, where um, women, they had women on Premarin which comes from, which is an equine hormone, comes from horses. It is, a met, it is a metabolite product from urine. And so what that means is, you know, we make three hormones as humans that, and then there's, there's more metabolites that we make when it goes through urine, but we produce three hormones, uh, estrone, estradiol, and estriol. When you're using an equine product, you're getting 17 plus hormones. And a couple of them are similar to the ones that we produce, but a lot of them aren't, you know, so, so what are the effects of that? So there was that. And then the other thing that was going on with those old studies is that they were using a progestin, which is not natural progesterone. Mm. So we talked about estrogen being proliferative and how it does when it's left unchecked, it can be, it can have some harmful tendencies. So what was happening, not I don't want, I don't like to use the word harmful, but you know what I mean? Negative, let's say some negative tendency. So what was happening is basically they put all of these women into an estrogen dominant state the entire time that they were doing the study because progestin suppresses ovarian production of progesterone. So basically these women had a lot of estrogen and no progesterone and they were having cardiovascular events. Mm. And so they just, they, they stopped they stopped it completely, this um, initiative that they were doing. And then for years and years and years, hormones got a bad rap mm. because of the, 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 mostly because of the progestin, because we're actually realizing now, well, estrogen is, is, is been shown to be um, less harmful when it's not taken orally, maybe a little bit more harmful when it's taken orally. So when you may, maybe you hear something about birth control pills contributing to clotting and things like that, which is, we don't have a lot of research on that, just a little tiny bit, but it's the oral delivery method that contributes to that. Mm -hmm. um, so back to the women's health initiative and the bad rap that, that hormones got for so long. So we have lots of studies, even though the mainstream narrative hasn't uh, revealed this, but there have been studies for years and years and years that have shown the protective benefits of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. So what we would call the hormones that they used in the Women's Health Initiative, we would call those HRT, hormone replacement therapy, not bioidentical, right? Because okay. the Promarin wasn't bioidentical to what our body produces and the progestin wasn't bioidentical. But we do have bioidentical hormones available to us that are exactly the same as estradiol, which is the most active form of estrogen that a woman produces. And that is exactly the same as progesterone that mm. a woman produces. I am so glad you're sharing all this because as you're talking and I'm trying to take it all in, I am I can't wait to re-listen to this on so I can understand all of this on another level. But I, the big takeaway I'm getting right now is twofold. Um, I, I'm so glad you said the thing about, because growing up when we did, I think we heard about hormones are bad, hormones are bad. And so when we were hitting like our forties and our friends were starting to talk about it, I, I can remember sort of thinking, well, I'm not, uh, that's, that's a bad thing. We shouldn't be doing that. You know, not really super consciously, but I had that in my head that hormones were bad. Right. And, and yet so many people are getting on it, feeling better. Then the other thing that just struck me was you said, we're not getting this information out now that we actually have bioidentical hormones that are good for us. And that just strikes me around women's health in general. 
Like mm-hmm. nobody's talking about the fact that we could actually feel better as we move through our life because, you know, I'll say it like the idea of just like, nobody fucking cares if we're getting mm-hmm. better, if we feel good. It's all about Viagra and blah and all this shit that makes men okay and not for us. So that's that's my big takeaway already right now. <laughs> Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah and i think you know we live in a really litigious medical society right and so there's a lot of fear around giving a woman something that might cause cancer and and i think a lot of people have that fear without doing the the work to understand that actually we have study after study after study to show the protective benefits of Mm. bioidentical estrogen and bioidentical progesterone for our brains, our hearts, and our bones. So it's out there. That research is out there. And they're now going back and looking at the Women's Health Initiative, all that with a different eye and being able to tease out, you know, the things that we're learning about estrogen versus progestins. And then all these other huge studies that have come out that really do show the protective benefit of having those hormones in our system. And especially um, visa, you know, around longevity and, you know, planning to live well into our eighties, you know, mm. what, what do our bones and our brains and our hearts need so that we're as healthy as possible. So mm. is there, is there a reason somebody would pick a, an HRT over a BHRT? Cause to me, it sounds like the only thing you'd want to do is the bioidentical. So there's only a few pharmaceutical products outside of the compounding pharmacy world that are BHRT based. So okay. there's um, there is an oral progesterone. It's in a um, a peanut oil base, so that doesn't work very well for everybody. Um, and there is um, there is estradiol orally, which again. You know, I've looked at the research and I, I'm not too, con- I'm not as concerned about oral estradiol as I once was. I think that the research is leaning more toward the benefit outweighing not using it at all, for sure. Yeah. Um, if, if, I, if, if we had to put it head to head with, with topical, some kind of a topical estrogen, I would definitely choose the topical over the oral, but it's not always available. And it is a pharmaceutical mm-hmm. product. And there are vaginal delivery pharmaceutical products as well creams um, that are meant for vaginal application. I don't think they're meant for thin skinned application. Um, And that would be estradiol and estriol. So is there a reason that somebody would choose HRT over BHRT really come down to what their doctor has available for them? Hmm. And a lot of doctors feel that if a woman doesn't have a uterus, there's absolutely no reason for her to be using progesterone. But we now know that progesterone had so many other benefits to our brain, our heart, and our bones, that it is worth, and because it's counterbalancing those effects, those proliferative effects of estrogen, we really want it in the picture. Uh, So the patch is the patch, um, is that what you meant by topical? Sorry, I forgot the patch. The patch is bioidentical estrogen delivery. I love the patch. I have the patch. Yeah. I love it. It's very well absorbed. We see it very well absorbed in um, lab samples and women, it, they feel great on the patch. And, and it's the, really truly the easiest delivery system of estrogen, in my opinion. Um, it costs money and it's, yeah. usually not, it's not covered by insurance. So, I would, I, well, mine is, mine is, but um, I, I I think I know Lisa knows the story. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but you know, I mean, Krista, you know that I, um, I was like hormonal, you know, still am sort of on the roller coaster, but was certain like estrogen had left the building was certain I was iron depleted. I'd had really heavy periods. And then they like came to a screeching halt. And, um, and so like, I had to really advocate hard to get blood work and sure enough, like your estrogen left the building. So the OB I went to at the time, she, um, she gave me a prescription for estradiol um, patch and progesterone. And I had friends who were like, oh my God, I've changed my life. I'm nice again. I'm happy. I just feel great. And such a small little patch, you won't even see it. And I get it. And it is like, I'm not kidding. It's this big, it's this big old white patch. Like it looks like you're trying to cover up a big tattoo or something. And I'm texting two different people, our friend Elijah and like my friend Sally and saying, um, why do you put this? And they're like, oh, just under your bra. I don't know. They didn't say bra under your like underwear. And I was like, what? 
And they, and so I send them a, like a photo over text and they both, they don't even know each other. They live in two different cities. They both wrote back, dude. And they send me back this little tiny, like see through yeah. thing. So after that, I was like, you know, looking and I created a meme, like here's Sally and Elijah this summer and like grabbed these stock photos of like these women frolicking on the beach. And here's Carrie because her estrogen depletion yeah. needs to be, you know, needs to be seen from space basically. And I <laughs> like found a woman of ca- carrying a mattress on her back, like <laughs> sweating. That's how, that's how like, and, and I asked her later, cause I was like, whoa, this is a lot. And she goes, we just needed to bring your like basement floor up. And it did help. And then I went to a naturopath who like cut that in half. And that seems to be the case for me. But the one thing, like I, I have a question for you about, cause I was thinking about before we hit record, I told you during COVID, my teenage son was like, I don't know why I'm so up and down and I feel emotional sometimes. And I said, that's hormones. And that's big for women, you know, middle-aged women and teenagers. And he was like, "Uh oh, that's all we got. So it makes me wonder about testosterone, which we haven't mentioned yet, but I am really curious about that. And we may touch on that later when we talk about sex hormones, but do we get more testosterone or is it that our estrogen leaves the building that it's more pronounced? We do get a little more testosterone after we go through menopause. So our levels do increase slightly. And, and that has something to do with the fact that testosterone also has the ability to convert into estrogen. It's called aromatization and it happens in the fatty tissue. And so that's another reason that women, when they go through menopause, they put a little bit of a roll around their waist that maybe they never had before because that fatty tissue is an important factory uh, for estrogen and converting mm-hmm. that testosterone into estrogen. And so we do tend to have slightly level, slightly higher androgen levels when we go through menopause, both DHEA and testosterone. Mm-hmm. So testosterone is the hormone that is going to certainly have something to do with our tech, our sex drive as will DHEA because they're the androgens, right? So women have androgens, men have androgens, men have more androgens. And that is why we would typically, you know, associate testosterone with, you know, sex drive in a man. It's not necessarily the thing that gives us our test, our sex drive as a woman. There's so many things that are contributing to that testosterone and DHEA definitely playing a role. Um, Interesting that DHEA comes from the adrenal gland. It doesn't come from the same part of the adrenal gland that produces cortisol. It comes from a different part of the adrenal gland and it kind of plays a role a little bit in like if, if someone isn't making enough cortisol, then we sometimes will see an increase in DHEA levels. And some women just tend to make more androgen levels than androgens than others, right? And so there's, there is a syndrome that some women have, it's called polycystic ovarian syndrome where they tend to make more androgens um, when they're younger women. That would be the label that we would, that w- we would use for a younger, like a, a still a menstruating woman. And then after a woman isn't menstruating anymore, then we call it metabolic syndrome. And it, and it mm. also um, is it, going to impact cholesterol levels, triglycerides, um, maybe blood pressure, things like that um, can be impacted by the testosterone and DHEA level being higher. They're also impacted by blood sugar. So when, so one of the things that we see with PCOS and metabolic syndrome is that um, women's blood sugar levels tend to be pretty unbalanced and that unbalanced blood sugar is going to impact um, a hormone called sex hormone binding globulin. And that's going to increase testosterone for women. The exact opposite happens for men. When men have imbalanced uh, blood sugar and they've got more fat around their middle, it's going to increase sex hormone binding globulin. It's going to decrease testosterone. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of this interesting interplay. And it's, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a separate issue from what happens with, you know, when a woman goes through menopause um, because blood sugar imbalance can happen at any time of life. But if someone has had blood sugar imbalance that hasn't been well managed, that's another one of those things that's really going to blow up when they go through menopause mm. and ever, all the hormones shift. Mm. Um, so a lot, so it's very in vogue right now to give a woman testosterone and um, testosterone also has protective benefits to our cardiovascular system and our bones. Um, an interesting tidbit about testosterone, if you use uh, testosterone 
on your vulva and your vaginal tissue and your clitoris, um, those tissues grow a little bit. And, and, and some women, you know, really find that that is a wonderful addition to their sex life and other women really freaks them out. So yeah, that's so interesting. So that application, that location, um, you know, there's, there's different places that you can apply it. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind if somebody is applying testosterone locally. DHEA can also convert into testosterone. So someone can take DHEA orally. It's a totally safe hormone to take orally. And um, a woman starts out at a lower dose and, and can increase it. And it has the potential to convert into testosterone. Um, so that's another way to look at it. And we can test all these things and we can look, what are your free levels of testosterone? What are your free levels of DHEA? Given your symptoms, is it something that we need to address? Mm, so I, go ahead. Uh, well, I, 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 mean, I have two questions that are popping up. One, mm. like, I mean, you're obviously, this is your, your jam, right? A normal doctor, um, woman or man, are, or, and I should say like a normal, normal OBGYN. Um, I, I, I'm talking to mine currently and I was pointing some things out, like some different, I, I don't, I am the opposite of Amy Pickard. Like I barely have hot flashes. I, my biggest thing may be like some pain that I think might be attributed to menopause. Um, I sleep well, all that jazz. Um, but as I was talking to her about it, she, she was talking about, yeah, we'll do this and then we'll test your hormones. And so I felt like she was pretty on board, but then at one point I said something and she was like, or that could be osteoarthritis, which you're right. It might be, but there was this place where I felt like her knowledge kind of ended and, and decided it was going to be something else. It was going to be osteoarthritis. Cause I've been a runner for so many years. Um, so my question is. Do they, do, do, do women need to go to a hormone doctor? Because it, do regular OBGYNs know this? And I'll let you answer that. Then I'll ask your second question, my second question. Well, um, those, so certainly OBGYNs are learning about hormones, you know, in their, their training. And I can't really speak for whether or not they're learning this more functional medicine approach. I know that a lot of them are seeking it out now okay. and we are, you know, I'm, I'm in the position of teaching it to all kinds of doctors of all stripes. So um, I can tell you that we certainly see a lot of them walking into this functional medicine aspect, right? And it's all about function, right? So it isn't, yeah. what are your levels? Are you within? And so one of the things that I see that's so interesting is that somebody will come in with their test results and they'll say, I'm normal. And I'm like, well, yeah, you're normal. You're a 55 year old woman and you're within the range for a 55 year old woman, which is low. Right. And so that's not necessarily going to feel good to you. Right. Um, so I can't really speak for other OBGYNs. Um, I'm not an OBGYN. I'm a right. natural doctor. Um, but I can say that there is more and more interest in this. And I think that people are really, their minds are becoming much more open to what's available. And there are, you know, I think a functional medicine, a, a doctor with a functional medicine stripe, whether that is a DO, an MD, or an ND, or a nurse practitioner, or mm -hmm. even a, a physician assistant, you know, who has that kind of training can provide this kind of assistance. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you. So I think that's one thing like I'm taking away that if you're, if I wasn't getting the answers, I felt in alignment with to find more answers, to go out and sort of search that out. So thank you. So, but then you sort of started my second question, which is, I already said, I'm going to re-listen to this pod. <laughs> and I have a feeling many of our listeners will re-listen. This might be one we have to listen to several times. Do you teach classes on this? Because this is a lot of stuff and you're, you're really good at explaining it in layman's terms, I think. So do you teach lay people versus just doctors? Thank you for saying that. Um, <laughs> I love teaching lay people. It's such a weird term. Um, I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I love teaching. I would much rather, I would much rather speak to lay people than to doctors. And Makes sense. <laughs> I, and, and that is um, something that I am looking to do more of. So okay. I'm looking to rebrand and looking to update my website. And I'm, I am actively pursuing that process right now. So I awesome. will definitely let you guys know when it's to a point where, um, something's actually happening. <laughs> yes, please. That'd be amazing. We'd love to send that out to the listeners as yeah. an opportunity. Yeah. 
Mm. And it's fun for me. I love doing it. Yeah. Also like you've just always been such a fun friend to have this way, not just because I was studying nutrition and really wanting to help women feel their best, but also just because we were all going through it. And you're one of the most curious, like knowledge seeking people there is. And, um, and that's very, like, that's very attractive. People want to learn from someone who is, who's really open to like, oh, this is what we used to think. And this is what I'm finding out now. And I really appreciate that about you. Yeah. Ah, so we realized when we were thinking about this conversation today that you have so much important knowledge um, to share with women of a certain age about all the, and the things ones coming that way, all the things, right? So we are going to pause and call this part three instead of just part three. We're also going to have a part four. So thank you. And just bring you back for part four, because we haven't even gotten to some of the, the, you know, the main things that women complain about or ask about a lot related to this. And that is, you know, sexual health and sex hormones and sleep. Cause you're such an expert on, um, the sleep thing for sure. And you know, a lot about how all these hormones work together. So I would love to, um, have everyone stay tuned for that. Yeah. And we're not going to have a song this week. We're going to, that's going to be the other carrot that we're going to leave for you. Krista's song will be in the next part, (laughs) but I'm so glad. Thank you for a spending this amount of time. And then this next amount of time you're going to spend with us as well. This has been fascinating. I'm so glad we split this up because this hormone piece was a lot and really, really good uh, background. And it just, gosh, yeah. So juicy. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So that's going to be it for this week's episode, but be sure to tune in next week for more with Dr. Krista in this series on hormones. And as always, if you liked what you heard, please like, and follow and share this episode with a friend. Really share this. Like anybody, you know, that even thinks they're about to go through through menopause, share this episode. All right. Well, thanks everybody. We'll be back next week. Talk to you soon. So long.